Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC, hello and welcome, CC, hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six, she sells seashells by the seashore, she sells seashells by the seashore, <laughs> there we go, rolling. There's a beautiful little island that you can walk to when the tide's out, and a lot of people get cut off by the tide, and this has been a big story because there's been like 20 rescues to this island. I was down there having a drink, and uh, I was there while they were rescuing people, so while the BBC may have covered this story before, I was actually there with my phone and I was able to film a live rescue, so there's little moments that you can capture all over the, you know, happening all the time, and that's the, the beauty of the beauty of the smartphone device. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 76. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. So now that Steven Soderbergh's latest film, Unsane, is out and everyone is talking about shooting films on their iPhone again, or whatever your mobile phone of choice is, it seems like a good time to remind everyone of two things. One, that Soderbergh today still remains one of the more inspiring filmmakers out there, who even though he's long been massively commercially successful, he is still constantly striving to try new things in his never-ending quest to return to his DIY filmmaking roots. Gotta respect that. And while the results have often been kind of a mixed bag, in fact, do you remember the Canon XL1 shot full frontal? It is pretty difficult to say anything too negative about the man. That being said, it is important to note that Soderbergh was most certainly not the first to shoot an entire film with his phone, nor was he the most effective. And Soderbergh, at least for the past 25 years, has been exclusively working in narrative features. There are many who might argue that documentary films have kind of naturally been the most effective at using this DIY approach of mobile phone filmmaking. But I'm not here today to argue which genre of filmmaking is best suited for mobile filmmaking or iOS filmmaking as many are often referring to it as. And by the way, from here on out in this discussion, if I do happen to use the term iOS filmmaking or mobile filmmaking, they're pretty interchangeable. I actually don't, you know, I actually do not mean to imply that Apple is certainly the only phone for this sort of thing. I do mean all mobile phones or devices that have, or mobile devices that have filmmaking capabilities. What I am here to argue, okay, maybe that's kind of a stronger word. I'm not here to argue as much as I'm here to simply offer some compelling reasons why you might consider shooting your next film with your phone and maybe your next film after that. Now, my own mobile phone filmmaking, for the most part, it's been restricted to getting pickup shots or shooting stylized footage for our Elvis of Cambodia doc using the 8mm app to emulate this archival footage look. And, and, and we're using it a lot, of course, to, to do this sort of 2018 version of, I don't know, home movies, right? Remember, we do have a two and a four-year-old. I'm still fully using our Canon C300 Mark II. It's superior to anything an iPhone is going to give you. Of course it is. Don't be silly. After all, it cost us $16,000 US, so it must be superior to image from an iPhone, right? 
But I do have a number of friends, including those who work in the film and TV industry, who have actually sold their higher end video gear and have fully embraced the whole iOS filmmaking, I guess let's call it a revolution. And I know that this has been the case for a number of you doc lifers out there. And so I would not only be an irresponsible filmmaker, but also a neglectful documentary filmmaking podcast host if I weren't engaging in dialogue about iOS filmmaking or mobile filmmaking. In fact, we talked with doc filmmaker Jack Ballow towards the end of last year. He's a filmmaker that has fully gone over to this mobile filmmaking thing. He even gives workshops that cover this during the summer. I think it was episode number 53, and we talked a bit about mobile filmmaking, but we certainly did not fully get into it. The episode wasn't dedicated to discussion of it. But this iOS filmmaking thing is massive, and it's not only not going away anytime soon, but it is most certainly growing in popularity very, very rapidly. And so I think it's high time we tackle this subject. And more than that, we're going to do it in two back-to-back TDL episodes, starting with today. This week, we'll be talking to former BBC and ITV news reporter Anna Breeze about her experiences since she's moved over to shooting and editing news stories independently with her mobile phone, as well as giving workshops throughout the UK about citizen journalism. And then next week, we'll be speaking with Neil Barham, who works for one of the most innovative apps out there for filmmaking with your mobile device, Filmic Pro. I'm actually really, really, really excited for this program, or I guess these two programs. I know that a lot of you are already making docs with your phones, and I'm very excited to fully engage in the practice myself, so this will be a very cool two episodes. So with that, why don't we get part one of this series on mobile filmmaking started with a segment that details five reasons to shoot your doc with your phone. I'm your host, Chris G. Parkhurst. Thank you for joining me today here on The Documentary Life. So let's dive right into five reasons to shoot your doc with your iPhone. Number one, it's cheap. I mean, come on. Of course that has to be one of the reasons, right? I mean, the fact that you don't have to spend a ton of your budget on a camera because you, in fact, already have a camera in your damn pocket, it's a great reason to shoot your film, right? Right. The fact is that many phones nowadays have 4K capabilities. They have high memory storage. And with the right accessories and or apps, they can get you not only decent images, but decent sound as well. There are different lenses that you can add on to your phone. There are a host of different gimbals from which to choose from to get steady or moving shots. Not to mention a lot of our phones now have built-in image stabilizers. You can shoot great looking video with your phone that you've already paid for or are currently making payments on. So why not save the cost of purchasing or renting a camera and lenses and just use what you already have? Number two, it's small and unobtrusive. I have to say that this is one of the most appealing aspects to this iOS filmmaking for someone like me. I do a lot of work in developing countries, whether it be in Haiti, Cambodia, or Nepal. And the fact of the matter is, whenever I'm carrying around a big old camera and miking up people, it has an impact on the setting. It affects, to some degree, how people are in front of the camera. Similar to what happened when DSLR filmmaking blew up, making documentaries with your phone it minimizes this impact on your film. And even more so, people nowadays in all sorts of cultures, they're fairly used to seeing people use mobile devices, whether for making calls, surfing the internet, or taking photos and video. And because of this, there's a natural comfort level for your subjects that you might not get if you were shooting them with a sizable camera. Believe me, if I'd had the opportunity to shoot a film like Journey to Kathmandu all over again, I would most definitely be shooting it with my phone. For one, I wouldn't have to lug big camera gear around the mountains. And two, my subjects wouldn't be so freaked out by this big piece of electronic machinery that many had probably never seen before in their lives. That low impact on an environment and its subjects is something doc filmmakers we've been dreaming about for decades. And now we've just about perfected it. Three, 
they weigh next to nothing. Now, don't downplay this one. Anyone who has spent hours and days roaming around shooting Verite for their dock knows what it's like to be lugging around a camera, lenses, batteries, filters. Even if it's attached to a solid set of rails and well-balanced shoulder mount, it's going to take its toll on the body. Simply put, cameras get heavy. Your phone, on the other hand, is not. And even if it does get tiresome holding your phone up for long stretches of time, the nice thing is that you can always take a break if you need it and tuck the phone nicely into your body and, and kind of hold it snug there while you shoot until you're ready to go again. Or if you're shooting with a gimbal, you can just keep alternating between hands. It's ridiculous, right? Doesn't really seem fair. But fair is whatever. We're doc filmmakers. We'll take whatever help we can get. Number four. Many can shoot in 4K. Yeah, I know, crazy. Phones shooting 4K. Who'd have thunk it? I mean, it truly wasn't that long ago that only the mid to high range video cameras were shooting in 4K. So this is a very cool thing. Absolutely it is. It opens up a lot of possibilities for you as a filmmaker. For one, it gives you a second angle should you decide to punch in on a shot in post. It also allows for plenty of wiggle room when working with footage and color correction if you're playing with the image in, say, you know, After Effects. Again, having 4K is very cool. But while I am excited by the 4K capabilities now available to some of the newer models of mobile phones, certainly the iPhone 8, 8 Plus, and the 10, as well as a host of Android phones, I do want to temper some of that excitement. You have to remember that you're still dealing with a very compressed image, which means it's like shooting with a number of the consumer DSLRs. It's in 8-bit with a 420 color space. I could be wrong, but when we owned the Canon C100, this was the compression rate that we were operating with. I mean, what do you expect though? You are shooting the media cards like SD cards. That's why people get external recorders, which allows them to shoot in something like 4K RAW if they'd like. Anyhow, with this kind of compression, you are going to start seeing some breakup in the image when you start playing with it and adding looks or adjusting contrast, that sort of thing. And certainly you're going to notice a big difference when you project it onto a bigger screen. That's just the reality of dealing with this kind of compression. I know that people get really hopped up on the 4K craze, but just be aware of some of the limits. That being said, it's still a damn phone, right? And it's incredibly impressive what you're able to shoot with a phone, right? Right. Lastly, number five, multi-camera capability. Because of the relatively low cost of a phone, at least in comparison to a video camera, and because so many of us have them nowadays, it's a pretty simple thing to roll more than one camera at any given time. And this is great for docs when shooting an interview or an event. When done right, it should be relatively easy to sync up afterwards when you bring it into the edit. Or perhaps you just like to have an extra phone or two so that when you fill up the drive space on one, you can easily just pick up another phone and keep shooting without having to stop and do a data dump. Having a backup camera or an additional camera to roll with is a pretty nice thing in any situation. And it's not something most of us doc filmmakers are really that used to having at our disposal. So it is most definitely a nice advantage to going the mobile route. So those are five reasons to shoot your dock with your phone. If you're someone who hasn't yet considered shooting a dock with your phone, you might now be inspired to think about getting out there and starting to just play around with your mobile phone's capabilities as is, maybe without any added lenses or gimbals or special apps. I bet you'll be pleasantly surprised what you'll be able to come up with. For an even closer look at what this whole iOS filmmaking thing could look like for you, up next we're going to have a conversation with former BBC and ITV reporter Anna Brees. And Anna has taken her journalism career in a whole new and exciting direction by jumping into the whole mobile journalism thing and shooting and editing news stories as an independent journalist. She is also giving mobile filmmaking workshops to companies and individuals through her company Brees Media. That conversation up next on The Documentary Life.
When I first started making documentary films, I was often making them entirely on my own dime. It wasn't that it was a conscious decision on my part, I just really wanted to get out and start making my film. Does this sound familiar to you? When you have a great idea for a doc and the opportunity to get out there and start shooting, you don't want to let something like money get in the way of that. And for a while, it may not, but unfortunately, unless you have unlimited resources, eventually it will. Not having money for your doc film will slow you down, reduce your crew size, your film production values and aesthetics, even the story you're able to tell. And that's not even accounting for the additional stress, frustration, and your inability to work on the project full time. We don't accept that for ourselves anymore, and we don't want you to accept it either. Money is out there for every documentary film, and that includes yours. Every day, money is donated or awarded to documentary films. Why not yours? The trick is in knowing where to look for it and how to secure it for your film. In the Documentary Academy, we have the most comprehensive funding module that you will find anywhere in any course on fundraising for your documentary film. We cover the A to Z on raising funds for your film so you will never again be left wondering where the money's coming from. Enroll in the Academy today by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash academy and start your journey to raising ten, twenty-five, dollars or even $100,000 for your documentary film. I'm speaking with Anna Breeze of Breeze Media today on the documentary Life. Anna is a former BBC and ITV reporter, and she has now really taken hold of the mobile journalism that has has very much become a big part of, of journalism today. And we are speaking with her as part one of two parts of our special on mobile filmmaking. Anna, very happy to have you a part of the documentary Life today. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me on to talk um, about something that I'm very passionate about indeed. And Anna, what's kind of interesting is we have a number of listeners with a both print and, and broadcast journalism background. Now, broadcast journalism is really kind of your background as well and very much, um, I, I, I dare I say, your specialty. And it's a big part of why we've had you on the program today. I think a good way to start this conversation might be to have some better understanding of what that journalism background consisted of for you. Well, I started off um, studying anthropology and theology, actually, which was uh, very interesting. I was going to be a missionary, study of man and the study of God. I thought that'd cover everything. Um, Then I ended up working for Rothschild's bank um, in the Channel Islands, making uh, rich people a lot richer, working on something called gearing as a credit executive. And then I got to the age, (laughs) well, very, very rich people who had like 30 million pounds and wanted to borrow another 100 million and the margin of of, um, money that they would make against their investments and the loan. Wow. Yeah, that's, that. that, it just didn't, it wasn't something that I was passionate about. I was 23 and I thought, right, come on, Anna, you're 23. You've got to have uh, really throw yourself at a career here, something mm. you're really going to enjoy and you're going to be able to make a difference. So I decided I wanted to be a journalist. My uncle was a sub on a newspaper called The Citizen in Gloucester, and he said, whatever you do, Anna, don't go into journalism. Um, <laughs> it's just not a good career at all. But I just I, I, I ignored him. My mum and dad weren't keen either. And there was something inside me I mean, that, that, that made me really kind of determined mm. i've always been quite a determined woman really mm. Mm. so i i went off and uh did some work experience it was difficult to get in so i did some work experience worked for free at my uncle's newspaper in gloucester mm. then i managed to get a job in newspapers in the Gurn, in the channel islands and i'll never forget that first job i got um i think it was oh, like fourteen thousand wow. pounds a year okay so you were doing year, so. okay so you were doing print journalism to start out then I started off doing print, yeah, and then I worked for about a year or two in print, Um, but uh, I'm a bit dyslexic, so I was always, (laughs) well, it's not ideal, is it, when you're working in newspapers, so I I struggled a little bit. There was, you know, funny words like compliment and compliment, and (laughs) I I just didn't, I used to, they're very, very, very fussy, the sub-editors on newspapers, and I, um, I was young, and for whatever reason, I struggled a little bit with a written word so yeah. I um 
I thought, well, let's give. I, I, in the Channel Islands, you don't need to be qualified to be a journalist, mm. basically. <laughs> Um, in the Guernsey and Jersey and the Channel Islands. Uh, But if you work in the UK, you do. So I knew I had to go off and get my broadcast journalism course or my NCTJ. Mm. So I I tried to get into Cardiff, which is one of the best broadcast journalism uh, courses in the country. Mm. Um, But I didn't get in. Mm. But nothing nothing stops that fight in me, I have to say. So I ended up doing um, broadcast journalism at Portsmouth College in Highbury. I was going to do newspapers, but... um, the broadcast journalism course I thought well it covers the same stuff media law and local government um and maybe uh, maybe I'm more suited to this because I have do have a bit of dyslexia so I ended up doing broadcast journalism then went back to the Channel Islands and ended up working in television for a couple of years and then I found the Channel Island community the Channel Island's quite small there uh, there's a lot of variety of, of stories and um there's not a huge amount going on there. And, uh, <laughs> well, well give, give us a glimpse of some of the stories that you were doing on the, cha- on the Channel Islands. Well, do you know what was really interesting about the Channel Islands was as a journalist, you did, mm-hmm. we didn't have a news desk. So I would, I would actually just literally be able to do whatever story I wanted. And I, did, I, I used to do lots of stories about travel, probably because I was desperate to get home because I'm from Gloucestershire. And I, uh, yeah, you, well, but there was a lot of, I could do a lot of investigative stuff. So, um Things like a Booper Health uh, Hospital hadn't had a health inspection for for five years, it, and lots of little stories I used to enjoy going off on my own doing investigative stuff. Um, and it was a good place to really develop the confidence on camera and confidence in my my scripts and my voice, um, doing some presenting. And it was just a, it was just a good start for building up the confidence and the skills. You know those skills that you you develop as a journal, broadcast journalist, i.e. Knowing when you've got your sound bite, stop recording. Knowing what shots you need. Knowing how to tell a story. Yeah. Knowing what contributors you require. Um, and I and I built up those skills there. And then went. I was very lucky to get a break at um, ITV Central in Oxford, and I went up working there as a broadcast journalist for ITV Central in Oxford, and yeah. then up in Birmingham, and then down to BBC in Southampton. So I was working every day on a regional news program. I had to fill a two-minute hole in the program. Mm. I knew I knew uh, whatever story I was sent to, even if it was a bit dry and had been sold to us as something else by somebody in their press office. I had to make that into engaging TV, and um, I grew. Yeah, I grew in confidence. You know, when you're working in a newsroom, in the TV newsroom, you have to sit next to people and voice your script in front of them. <laughs> um, do you know when you when you've got your microphone and you're doing your voiceover, and and everyone's sort of like everyone's just hashes down and it you know to start with pieces to camera and voiceover work was was difficult for me it was difficult for me I didn't feel particularly comfortable mm. but um that confidence came in time and I ended up doing lots and lots of presenting I did a lot of news presenting and the confidence grew. Anna I'm curious uh, going from really kind of uh, searching out and finding your own stories and being responsible for your own stories in the Channel Islands. How was that different um, when you were working for both the BBC and ITV, much bigger regions, and you're being assigned stories, were you not? Absolutely. And uh, you could be one day, you could be doing the lead story for the programme. You could be doing kind of um, something like a a big accident or terrorist. I covered the London bombings, for example. Um, And then at another time, you could be given a story where it's just the and finally, something that's quite light and, uh, and, and humorous. So I had that difference really between um, in the Channel Islands having to create my own story. So you have to get, cont- you know, you have to build relationships with the community, with politicians right. and with businesses. Um, you have to ask lots of questions, make lots of telephone calls. You have to be quite, you know, organized and make sure that you've got stuff coming up that uh, could potentially be a story, keep in touch with people. So it's it's a lot, yeah, it's a very different, really. And and knowing, do you know what the biggest thing is? Knowing what's important to people, because mm. I always felt that, I always had that responsibility as a journalist, as I had that power to fill two minutes of the programme in the Channel Islands every single day. Mm. Was I covering the stories that were relevant to everyone? And that's something that I I felt that responsibility, and I, and I still think that that's... The role you have as a journalist is such an important one mm. um, to be hold people to account, to always be looking and investigating, um, asking questions, asking difficult questions, challenging people, getting under the surface of the stories and not just listening to what you were given very often in press releases. Uh. Um, now, I, 
when I came to uh, work for uh, ITV and the BBC in Birmingham, for example, or down Southampton, we uh, the resources meant that we weren't able to do as much investigative stuff. So we had to very much have things in the diary that we knew we could go and film. Right. So we would we would rely on the companies providing press releases of events that were happening. And the reactive stuff, I on the day stuff, mm. would only usually be maybe 10% of the program. The rest of it would be um, pre-planned. Yeah. So we would, it was different. I think it was it was different at the BBC. When I went to work, go from ITV to the BBC, the BBC had more people working on planning um, and, and having a little bit more time to investigate stories. But then the actual daily news program, you have to produce a half an hour program mm. every single day. Wow. So you, you have to have things in the diary. You can't, you can't just say, right, today we've got nothing planned. We're just going to go out and see what's happening. Let's go find something region. to fill a half hour slot, right? <laughs> you can't do that. You just can't do it. And it's a, quite a big region as well. I mean, the Midlands was a massive region, as was Southampton. Mm. You have, so you have to have relationships with, with people. I mean, we used to get stories from the newspaper. When I first started in TV, that was very interesting. Mm. Uh, the, news, the newspaper always used to have the best scoop. So we used to always copy our lead story was almost always the front page of the Citizen newspaper right. or, the, or the Echo. And now it's the other way around, isn't it? It's, yeah, certainly. Uh, newspapers are chasing TV stories. So, I um, yeah, it was very different. The Channel Islands, yeah. um, I was probably more of a, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed that more. Um, it was more satisfying. Well, and it's interesting because I think, and, and, and we're going to get to this momentarily, it's really in many ways, uh, you've kind of returned to roots in the style of of journalism that you are now fully embracing, and not only embracing, but you are teaching others to do as well. So, um, you know, with that, it's a big part of the reason why we've had you on the program today. Is is we are talking about mobile filmmaking or or mobile storytelling in this instance. When did when did the idea of using this little device that fits in the back of your pocket, when did that start to take hold for you in terms of an idea of a way to start telling news stories? Well, I it kind of happened um, by accident, really. Hmm. I, um, I stopped the job at the BBC back in 2009, 2010, and I've been working for the National Union of Journalists in their training Wales. So... We had funding from the Welsh government to provide training to freelance journalists, mm. and one of the course one of the courses that we ran was called "How to Shoot and Edit on an iPhone." Ah. Um, and we had a trainer come in, um, and whenever we ran that course, it was incredibly popular with communications and marketing people yeah. and, um, and freelance journalists as well. And I attended that course, and I found that people were were book- we were selling out that course really in twenty four hours, and with a waiting list, there was a huge demand for wow. it. So I learned uh, a chap called very, a very talented uh, journalist, um, the ex-editor of the Birmingham Mail called Dan Mason trained me. And I, I was just thought, right, this is amazing. The quality now, um, what I'm able to do um, and broadcast. So I, I just started creating content and, and saying, you know, I can film, edit and broadcast within an hour, the mm. same quality of TV journalism that I used to, to create back in, um, back at ITV and BBC. I mean, I worked in, in broadcast journalism at the BBC and ITV from 2000 to 2010. Right. Um, and then six, seven years, I worked in the, for the NUJ Training Wales, National Union of Journalists Training Wales. And then in the last eight months, I've started this business. And I um, I appreciate lots of people listening to this, uh, people making documentaries. Now, I, I filmed, edited, produced, presented, did the whole thing on my phone, a 10 minute um, news program. Um, right, right. And, and people said to me, it, it's exactly what, it was just like watching the BBC. It was just like watching um, BBC X-Ray that I worked on in oh, wow. Cardiff. And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> um, I just put my, I put my phone on a tripod. I got my um, microphone attached and, and I just talked to the camera as if I was pr- broadcasting live with an you know five six years ago i'd have needed a truck a satellite truck that's right <laughs> um i'd have had a camera crew there i mean we it, and i just thought to myself this is amazing it almost feels like 
you know, I really love the film Back to the Future. <laughs> and you know when you watch the, you know what you watch Back to the Future when they go forward in time and there's all these crazy stuff like they can put stuff, pizza gets made in like three seconds and the hoverboards and things like that. I feel like I'm in the future now. Yes. I'm starting to feel like the future is here right now. Um, and it's happened very quickly. And I look at like my iPhone 4 and think, oh my God, have, that, have you got any old smartphones? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, that, that's like from, that's from 1927, the iPhone yeah, 4. Yeah, right. Well, no, it, it wasn't. It was like 2011 I had an iPhone 4. But I look at it now and look at what I've got now with my iPhone 10. And you're looking at 4G, 5G, 4K. Yeah. Um, I'm able to talk to you now. That's right. Uh, I I can broadcast live through Facebook, Twitter. Yeah. Do you know what I love is Periscope, Periscope Live, the Twitter live broadcasts. When there's been an incident somewhere around the world, uh, I love going on Periscope Live and talking to the people that are there and they'll talk back to me. And I mm. say, well, what's happening there? Mm. And talking directly instead of waiting for that news to be picked up by the big rolling news channels. Interesting. I can talk to the people that are actually there after it's happened. Now, Anna, how did what does this look like? So, if you're getting on Periscope, and you'll forgive me because while I know of Periscope, I'm not using it. I understand the broadcasting live capabilities of it, but but what I'm curious about is when you're speaking with somebody, and maybe you're coming, you know, you're covering a, a news story or an event from afar. How is the consumer receiving that? Are they watching it on YouTube? Are they watching it through Breeze Media? Are they watching it through Periscope? What does that look like? Well, so you're so say that question again. I'm not sure I understand. So, if there was a if there was a major um, incident, say in London, right, you can you can open the Periscope app. Yes. Um, and when you open it, it's basically a picture of the whole of the the globe, the whole world. Yeah. And all the red dots are people broadcasting live. Ah. So you can go anywhere in the world and and watch people as they're there live, and you can talk to them, ask them questions, and they'll most of the time they talk back to you okay um so say i don't know uh i went to north i could go to north korea and there was it was 4 a.m and somebody was walking to work yeah i could talk to them what's it really like there or um after a, ter a terrorist event or when there was you know a big weather event you can actually see live mm. and what what often happens is say for example sky news here or bbc news they're on it as well and they'll record it and then they'll put it on the news channel, but it'll take a good sort of 15, 20 minutes until it's on the the uh, terrestrial TV. Right, so until it's on TV. air, right. Until it's on air, yeah. Yeah. So you're seeing it real time and you're talking to the people that are actually there. You're not talking to professional journalists, right. you're just talking to people that are witnesses. Um, so I, I love ah. Periscope and I wish that more people would use it really because it's... Uh, it's fascinating. It sounds very powerful. I guess what what I'm curious about, Anna, and, and I'm, I'm fascinated by this. How am I watching, if you're speaking with somebody in North Korea, right? You have found somebody, I assume you have found somebody via Periscope, right? And you're having a conversation with them. How am I watching your reporting? Well, I don't, I don't, um, this isn't me report i'm not i don't do any reporting on this this is just okay. me as a consumer oh so this i'm describing i'm describing periscope ah. as as somebody who's interested in what's going on in the world okay i should rewind i should rewind a little bit actually because i haven't given all of the details as to why i'm doing what i'm doing with regard to mobile journalism it's very much related to documentaries and youtube yes please i so when I worked in the BBC and ITV, I was I was aware that a lot of the the news that we were producing was coming from press releases. Now, as an organisation, you've got to have a lot of money to have a communications department and a marketing department and yeah, a PR right. department. Um, and some of the stories, like Dr. David Kelly, I don't know if you know about that story, the guy that was um, the weapons inspector yes. that supposedly committed suicide. There were was, there was some stories that I covered, and I thought, I'm not sure we're getting the official version of events yeah, here. Yeah, right. It's difficult to know. It really is. And I don't know if we, as journalists, are really getting the truth. Mm. So I, I'm very passionate about skilling up ordinary people to use their devices to expose greater truths and accountability. Because I knew whenever I did a story, I couldn't get to every voice. That's right. Um, I couldn't cover off. Obviously, I would come in and come out and I'd be 
I'd be in and out in an hour. Mm. And then I would put that video or news story forward as the authority. Mm. But at the end of the day, I'd only spent an hour. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. People. Exactly. So I always felt as a journalist, the truth was more important to me than, than the ego. So it's more about me providing those skills to enable other people to interpret their world, wow. their, their stories and their voice. Um, I think that's going to make the world a better place. So I watched, started to watch lots of documentaries on YouTube about things like 9-11 um, and Princess Diana. And I have got no idea yeah. really what the truth is on some of these. But there were important issues raised in these documentaries. And it made me think differently about news and about journalism and about how um, we all have the power now to communicate through video to the platforms that are already there, the social platforms. And I um, I want to encourage people to do that, even on a small scale community journalism. I feel already mm. where I live, there's a Facebook group and I'm connected with the community more because people are posting stuff about what's happening, um, events, you know, controversies, things that I am more aware now of what's going on in the local area because people are picking up their devices and they're sharing that information. Amen, sister. This, it's fantastic. I mean, there couldn't be a greater need for not only authenticity, but really getting, disseminating information, or, or I, I should say gathering information in a way that's not simply um, simply relying on one, two, or three of the major news sources that are out there. Uh, I can very much appreciate. You know, I come from a broadcast journalism background initially myself as well. I come from come from TV news, so so a lot of this conversation I've I've appreciated on that level. But really, in particular, what you're saying in these moments now, where you feel the importance of getting back to okay, look, it's it's less about the ego ego of being on camera or how I tell this story or the way that I come across and much more about, well, what is the truth of some of these stories and how can we best find those and, and, and then let's get them out there. So um, yeah, right on, Anna. I love it. I, I'm so happy to hear that. And it really gives great context into the work that you're doing now, all with citizen journalism. So thank you very much. I'm curious. Have you gotten, what type of response have you gotten from, whether it's former employees or, you know, people that you've worked with in, in say, the BBC or ITV? What are they, do you have a sense of what that community feels about citizen journalism? I do have an idea. I mean, I'm, I'm very involved in a few kind of networks, conversations regarding this sort of on Twitter. Um, but there's a big Mojo Festival going on at the moment, Mobile Journalist Festival. Yeah, in Galway, um, that's right. Well, I said, you know, what is a mobile journalist? It's, it's a person with a device interpreting the world around them. Mm. Well, that's everyone, isn't it? Everyone <laughs> yeah. who's got a mobile device interpreting the world around them is a journalist. And I, I am um, one of these people that believes every single voice and every single story has value. Every, everyone. And um, I... I could have gone back to the BBC. I was offered a full-time job, right. good, really good money. But my father brought me up to be a caring and compassionate person who, who wants to make a difference in the world. Hmm. So I want to bring about um, a greater truth um, to people's lives. And I think there are some uh, toxic definitions within the established media sometimes with regards to things like success. I mean, what's success? success? Uh. What's beauty? Um, I think oh, people who are old can feel ugly because they're old or people who've I think that it's, it's a lot of it's unconscious bias and as journalists I wasn't aware that I had an agenda really until I started training to be a psychotherapist oh boy in the I'll last bet. couple of years <laughs> and, and it, you do you think oh god yeah I really do have a bias and um and you don't when you ask questions as a journalist and you put your packages together you think you're being impartial and you think you're being balanced but but and we do try, but blink and act, do we try? We really do. Broadcast journalists do try. They're genuine, wonderful people. Mm. But I got under the surface of that, and there is an agenda. And I, I want to help to try and open up the world and change definitions a little bit more when it comes to the things like um, truth and love mm. and justice and success. And um, I don't, uh, yeah, the, the whole citizen and community journalist thing, I think, what makes a journalist? It's a very difficult question. Um, what do you think? I've, I'd love to know what you think on that. It's something that I'm yeah, 
um, it's quite a, it's, it's something that's changing. It's, it's interesting. You know, we have in the doc filmmaking community, we have similar sort of conundrums at times because, you know, you have a conscious decision to make early on in the process of say the making of your doc film and it's okay how much do you want your voice or your opinions known do you want to try to remain sort of as objective as possible and 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 the fact of the matter is Anna and this I think goes for this goes for uh you know tv journalism this goes for doc filmmaking um which is that no matter you can try to remain as objective or tell as an objective a story as possible, but no matter what, it is coming to some degree from your voice. Or in the case of doc filmmaking, when you're working in, a lot of the work that I do tends to be um, in, in developing countries. And, and you know, uh, some of these people have, have maybe never seen a camera in their lives. And so that has an impact and effect on the story. Your mere presence as a doc filmmaker or a storyteller, as a journalist, has some sort of impact. And so... I find, you know, and we have this discussion a lot really in the in the program is that what are the things that we can be doing to minimize the impact on our environments? What can we do to minimize the impact that we have as either journalists or or doc filmmakers to be able to tell as authentic and true um, a story as possible? And I think this with what you're doing with really mobile storytelling with with mobile phones i i feel like that is a step in the right direction for telling those authentic and true stories and having minimizing impact for, if for no other reason than so much of the world we're used to seeing mobile phones we're used to seeing them out whether it's people surfing the internet taking photos shooting video having phone conversations having skype conversations whatever the case may be we're accustomed to seeing these devices all the time and i think that 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 will help us as filmmakers and as journalists because People are just more comfortable seeing these devices as opposed to seeing a big camera, you know, being lugged around in an, in an environment. And so I think with what you're doing, you're really onto something um, in, in you're in the in, you're very much in the right direction in helping try to tell the most authentic and, and uh, uh, objective stories as possible. And then there's the whole discussion, which you're you, you know, you're you're really referencing, which is what is this idea of who is a journalist? You know, what is the definition of a journalist? Um, there's, of course, the, you know, like yourself, you're, uh, you have a professional and qualified back, background, but now you're teaching people who, ne who don't necessarily have that professional background by any means or credentials, but you're teaching them how to tell a story um, and tell a new story with their phones, how to shoot it, how to, how to, how to tell the story, how to present, how to edit it, and then how to broadcast it. And, and it's, uh, I just, I commend what you're doing. And I think it's really interesting stuff, um, all around for us, uh, for us storytellers with what's, what's happening with technology and, and in many ways with what, what you're doing, um, in some ways you're at the forefront of it and it's, uh, it's great stuff. Well, I, I would, uh, I would love to be. I mean, it's it, for me. It's not about any kind of financial gain. But I, yeah. I, look, I always think about. It's interesting what you just said because I think back to when I studied anthropology at university. Um, yeah. I'm an anthropologist. Goes and by the to, way, a lot of doc filmmakers have anthropo anthropological backgrounds. It, it, it goes I bet hand they in do. hand. Yeah. Well, as an as an anthropologist, if you go into a community or culture to cover it, you're only allowed to take a paper and a pencil. Yeah, yeah. You're not, yeah. You have to eat what you have to eat. What they eat, you cannot take anything because it right. would it would um, dilute the culture, wouldn't it? Or it would infect it in a way, almost like that culture is like a beautiful butterfly or a rare species. Mm, absolutely. So, but if you gave them the tools to tell their own story, I mean, do you find then, say, for example, if you interview somebody yeah. and ask them questions, would you get a different product at the end of it than if you just said to them, right, I'm going to leave this phone with you and um, talk tell me your message because when you ask a <laughs> when you ask a question you're directing them aren't you in a way you're actually directing and interpreting the story absolutely as it goes along absolutely it's a different product at the end of it i suppose um but i think i'm very fascinated by 
I'm fascinated by the direction of of society at the moment and how things are going and, and looking at things that that maybe the mainstream media didn't predict, such as Brexit, such as Trump. Wow. Um, and the disconnect, well, the disconnect between the established media yeah. and the population. That's right. The disconnect, the disconnect in how, because what I found in the newsroom is a lot of people had been to private school. Mm. And they had Cambridge and Oxford graduate, Cambridge and Oxford graduates. Mm. Um, and you had to talk a certain way. That's another thing I, I find really irritating about uh, the established media or mainstream media is you have to you have to talk a certain way. So particular accents they didn't like. Ah, uh, so uh, uh, for sure, for sure, yeah. That's a massive issue for me because um, how can you say one voice is okay, one voice isn't okay to tell the news? Yeah. And I I find accents it's very interesting. You know when you have the Google navigation system, there's a voice. And it sounds like the guy from Bond, James Bond, is a cue. <laughs> so it's like that's a, that voice is a voice I trust. So there's certain accents that people trust. There's certain accents still in the UK, and it's it's really rather a, a voice like that. Where yes. We're going to trust. We're going to trust that voice because that's the voice that gives us our news. Yeah. Right. Right. Whereas if it's like the valleys, I'm from the valleys. I'm not going to be telling you the news like that. Oh. And I. That's what I'd love to change as well. It's all these beautiful voices and accents, um, of, you know, that variety and that colour. I would love that to be, um, you know, I'd love somebody with with lots of different voices. To I, I, I've been to a cafe and done a news bulletin just on my phone because I want to encourage other people to do it. I want to inspire other people to do it. Right, right. Brilliant. I love it. I love it, Anna. Tell us a little bit about the workshops and, and, and who you're teaching these workshops to and what the response has been like. Well, I, um, to start with, because I was a journalist, I had never, ever been self-employed before. Yeah. I just thought, I just thought. <laughs> Welcome to oh, my world. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. What a shock to the system that yeah. is. Um, I just thought, oh, I'll put on some workshops and I'm sure people will come. Yeah. Um, and they didn't. So I cancelled them all. And then I started oh. basically... I did I did lots of videos for people for free. So mm. I did charities and I started creating video. And then people said to me, oh, when are you putting on the workshops again? I suppose because people could see I had the skills then. Uh, I was actually, actually able to show that I could do it. Uh, so the uh, workshops are going really well. I've got um, people from charities, lots of communications people, marketing people, small businesses, mm. freelance marketers, people... Um, I've uh, I've been training the NHS here in Wales, their comms team. Oh, wow. Ad Admiral's a big insurance company. Who else have I been training? So lots of corporate yeah. clients I've got. So yeah. I do lots of in-house training. But I let people come. If they can't afford to to come or they're on a low income, then they, they I train people for free. Wow, that's um, fantastic. And, uh, and it's going well. I'm really enjoying it. I do a one-day course and teach people with the app KineMaster. Yeah, which is the the editing app that I really like. Have you have you ever done any kind of filming and editing on your device? I have. I I, I have a little bit, but I haven't. I'm not that familiar with KineMaster, and so I'm curious to hear about that a little bit. What do you use? Do you use iMovie? Or? Well, I won't. So what I'll do is, if I'm shooting something with the iPhone, I'm using you know I'll use Filmic Pro, um, and then I'll I'll basically import that, and then I'm editing off my laptop. So I have never. Oh, I've got you. I have never edited anything off of my iPhone, and so I'm certainly curious about that. I think the beauty with iPhones, because you can do it pretty quickly, yeah. can't you? Just do it in a DSLR and editing on your laptop. The beauty of iPhones is going to be more live broadcasting, I think, but mm. also being able to turn it around on location very quickly right. to wherever you are and capturing moments that where you may not have a proper camera with you. Yeah. Obviously, those moments happen all the time, don't they, wherever you could <laughs> Absolutely. be. Um, well, I was, for example, I was down, uh, there's a beautiful little island that you can walk to when the tide's out and a lot of people get cut off by the tide. And this has been a big story because there's been like 20 rescues to oh, this God. island. Um, and I went, I was down there having a drink and uh, I was there while they were rescuing people. So while the BBC may have covered this story before, yeah. I was actually there with my phone and I was able to film a live rescue. So there's little moments that you can capture all over the, you know, happening all the time. Wow. And that's the, the beauty of the beauty of the smartphone device but the the editing capabilities of kitty master i mean i've there's nothing i can't do with it i'm uh, oh fantastic. i'm really really loving using it yeah 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 that's fantastic i'm definitely going to be going to be looking into that Anna, what i'm curious about now is i i know that you know through breeze media you are conducting a lot of these workshops now and how much 
how much reporting per se are you doing now and and where can we find that I, uh, reporting wise, I have been working on a small local TV um, channel That's on right. Facebook. So I've posted those um, programs to YouTube. Um, and uh, I'm also writing about my experiences. So things yeah. like working with other local news organizations, how to get advertising. Is it better to have a sponsorship or mm. subscription model? Mm. Um, and looking at how you build relationships with the local community. Uh, as a small, you know, as a, as a local mobile journalist, um, and the importance of things like truth and trust and reputation and balanced reporting and using all of the wonderful resources that we've got now on social media, because there's a lot of talk in the UK about local news is dead, local newspaper circulations, are, you know, they're they're really really oh, yeah. struggling. Oh, yeah. well, I I I really do disagree with that. Mm. In that, there's mm. wonderful wonderful rich resources of local news Facebook groups. So. Facebook village hubs. Um, mm. We've got one here. We've got 25 posts a day in a very small village of all interesting, relevant local news. Wow. But they're run, they're run by volunteers and they're run by citizen journalists. So people that don't have media law training, so yes. they don't understand things like defamation or copyright. Mm. Well, they must um, be looking to you for advice, I would imagine, a lot then. Yeah. I mean, they're doing the best they can. Yeah. But the great thing about Facebook is it's transparent. So people can, I mean, obviously you can post stuff and it doesn't get they turn it away right. but um it's a small community so i think it's it's a much more open and transparent form of news than one person in you know the old i don't know 20 years ago just one reporter in an office yeah um choosing what stories to cover and not and choosing what letters you know the letters page in the newspaper mm. some people's comments get in some people's don't yeah well the thing about social media obviously is there's a lot more voices mm. and there's a lot more content and there's a lot more variety and i think it's changing the world as well i think people are becoming um i don't know do you feel i just feel this undercurrent of something really exciting's happening yeah it's interesting i mean anna and 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 i could yeah, I, I feel like uh, I feel like I will be having more more conversations with you um, in the future. I, I, I could talk about this topic um, for a long time, and uh, and you are someone I would like to speak to about a lot of this. I love talking about this, and I'm um, I'm really appreciate giving me a chance to um, to chat to your audience as well about it. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Anna, as as we do wrap up here, I'd love to hear. Are there any sort of uh, are there any sort of final suggestions? or recommendations that you would have for our doc filmmakers in terms of mobile filmmaking or more mobile storytelling that uh, that you could leave us with well what i always say to um to the people i train is that the great thing about a mobile device is to capture a moment capture beautiful wonderful moments um around you and people were more relaxed on mobile devices, I think, compared to, to bigger cameras. I really would recommend using a microphone and some kind of tripod or stabilizer. It can make a huge difference. And for me, that's what takes my video from being, you know, an amateur look to a professional look. So I've got a I've got a kit list on my um, my website, and I always make sure that I never recommend anything that I haven't used myself. Um, and it's always affordable, and it's always compact and easy to carry. So yeah, I I really would would recommend that people have a look at Kinning Master um, as an editing app. Uh, it's fantastic. There's another one called, um, there's AutoCue apps as well, which act as an AutoCue on your phone. If you're just a bit nervous about talking to camera, oh, you, right. can, you can download your script and turn your phone into an AutoCue. <laughs> so why you read, that's really cool as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's lots of lots of things out there. Um, okay. But yeah, my, my advice to people making documentaries is well done and keep it up. I love it. And I, my favorite channel and what I watch all the time whenever I have any free time is YouTube. Absolutely. And, all, and other documentaries. I watch Netflix and Amazon. I don't watch normal telly anymore yeah, because okay. I know that my, ch my children don't. And the broadcasting brands that we're going to trust in the future will be more of your kind of user generated platforms such as Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, Facebook. That's right. And, and the website that we could go to to check out that kit list, is it breezemedia.com? Breezemedia.co.uk, yeah. I'm sorry, of course, of course. That's okay. <laughs> Breezemedia.co.uk, and we will be putting links to a number of the things that we have talked about here on today's program. We'll go ahead and, of course, as we always do, put them up in the show notes. 
Anna Brees, uh, I would love to have you on the program again at some point. You have a lot to say, and it's a great discussion that we um, digital storytellers uh, are more than eager to participate in, and uh, you are someone I'd like to hear more from. So fantastic. Well done, and thank you for being on The Documentary Life. Thank you very much. And what I would say is none of us are in this to make money, are we? We're doing it because we um, we enjoy telling stories and we love communicating the true world around us. So keep up the good work. And um, I appreciate very much you uh, giving me the opportunity to talk today. Thank you so much, Anna. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.